Who? Yes, the easiest one. Who is the author, the recipient? Who are the main characters? We want to know not just their names, we want to know about them. What's the relationship? What are their circumstances? What are their needs? What's the second and third question? I'll put them together. Where and when? Excellent. We're looking really at kind of like the culture of that time, Politi uh, political issues, religious issues, you know, where in the world were they? Because if they're on the coast, they're being a port city, might have certain influences with wealth and exposure to ideas. You know, we talked about, I already said religious practices. You know, we talked last, a couple days ago about, you know, really viewing the work of Christ through that first century Jewish mindset because he really operated like a Jewish rabbi to a Jewish culture. So you really understand that context helps us understand how we go about teaching. All right. The last question is, has nothing to do with the meaning, but it has to do with uh, the what is the genre. Yeah, so how is this kind of literary context written. And when part of that literary context, we said, you know, do some paragraphs, somebody just kind of look for the author's flow. So not just understand the type of writing it is, but also understand how the author wrote in kind of that flow. And then we said, okay, we want to understand what's important in this, because there's all, these, all this information, and there are clues. And I kind of relate it to the way I teach, and that I will either repeat something often or write on the board. And so we said, there are three things to look for. And the first one is things that are emphasized. Okay, so things that are emphasized are emphasized one of three ways. What are some of those ways that something is emphasized? Someone hasn't spoken yet. What? Rep, okay, that's, that's the second one, emphasize, repeat, related. Let's say just with emphasize. Carl? Um, stuff that's like in like large amount of space. Large amount of space, yeah, so the author goes into great detail. Excellent, what's another one? You got your hand. The order, yeah, the order something's written in. You know, it's going from general to specific. There's one last one, emphasize. Large amount of space, order, and sometimes we have a stated purpose. Excellent. Yeah, sometimes the author just tells you uh, flat out, here's what this is all about. Okay, so then we have things that are repeated. Excellent, Rachel. What are some of the things that we want to look for that are repeated? Key phrases. Key phrases? Yeah, so you see this word over and over used again. Excellent. What's another thing that's repeated we want to see? Yeah, so main characters that are continuing throughout Scripture or even that story. Excellent. What's another one? Excellent, yeah. Anything from the Old Testament repeating the New Testament, that's huge. That's like a big spiritual needle on highlight going over it. A lot of times we see patterns or circumstances repeated. The last one is things that are related, related. So you have emphasized, repeated, related. The last thing that are related are literary terms. And these are probably the hardest ones for us because most of us are not English majors. Most of us fail grammar. And the problem is that we sometimes don't think about how things are structured and how things are related to each other just within the passage. And so in your book, there's some lists of different things to look for. I just kind of walked you through section one of your paper. I just kind of walked you through all the different steps you're going to want to take to really observe the passage. But the reality is this. You're going to have all these details. You're going to have just pages and pages of notes of things that you observe in the text, especially for a book like Esther. It's a great story. So then how do you make sense of it? Well, what we're really looking for is the relationship. Okay. We're looking for the relationship of all these details to each other. So I'm going to give you an analogy of how this works, and this hopefully will show up on the video. All right, so I, we are right now in a building called Myers. It's on one of the far edges of the campus by Biola Avenue. My daughter is a freshman, okay? Let's pretend that I am not a professor who's been here for a while. Let's pretend like I'm a dad whose daughter is here as a freshman, and I want to find her dorm. I happen to show up at this building in Myers trying to figure out where I need to go. Well, my daughter's living in the dorm alpha, okay, which I have been told is a long walk away, okay? So what I like to do is I like us to figure out how we're going to get from where alpha, uh, from where we are here in Myers, how you're going to direct me to get to alpha, okay? So Amanda, will you do me a favor? Just kind of stand up, okay? You are going to be um, our, our classroom, okay? Um, Luke, no, sorry, sorry, you're a guy. Rachel, okay, you're a lady. Alpha's a girl's dorm. Why don't you go stand kind of in that corner, not quite all the way to the corner, but kind of stand way over there because I know it's far, far away. All right, so that's where I'm trying to get to. You are the campus, okay? Now, is Alpha the very last thing on the campus if we go that way? What else is over there? Sigma, okay, Luke, you're going to be Sigma because that is the guys do live there too, I believe. So just stand on the, there you go. Excellent job. Do you see what just Rachel just did? Rachel basically just said, you know what? 
there's something on the other side of me I need to move. All right, we're kind of seeing where the relationship between alpha and sigma now are. And we see the relationship between alpha and where we are here in Myers. It's a long way away. So I'm over here at Amanda. I'm in Myers. I'm this lost dad. Got to give my daughter some money because it's college, right? So daughters need money in college. So I have money in my pocket to give to her in alpha, but I can't get there. So I come to you and say, how do I get to alpha? What's the first thing you're going to say? Someone just give me an idea. How would I get from Myers where we are now to alpha over there? What's the first thing you're going to say? Walk out the building. Okay, and which, where do I go then? I would point in the general direction. And the bell tower. Okay. Now, where's the bell tower between Myers and, and Alpha? In the middle. Okay, so Carl, you're kind of in the middle. Go ahead and stand up, please. Okay, you're going to be my bell tower. All right? So I want you to come over here and strike the pose. Show us how the bell tower looks. <laughs> there you go. I like it. All right, good bell tower. Okay. Now, is that the, I'm not, I can't see the bell tower from Myers, right? I don't walk out the door and see a bell tower. So what, what's, what do I see? Ta okay, there's a couple different things we see. We see library. Okay, where's the library in relation to, to the bell tower and Myers? Okay, back here, like where Connor is or where Selena is? All right, Selena, would you stand up and be our library for us? All right. Not really sure if the library has, maybe you can do like this for the dome on the top of the library. Oh, the book. She's holding the book. Very good. Video, I don't know if you can see that, but she's holding a book. All right, so I walk out, but you know what? I still can't see the library really, can I? There's a couple things between Myers, the library, and the bell tower. What are those buildings? We have Calvary Chapel. All right, so that's probably the first thing. So it's probably right where you are, uh, uh, Samantha? Sarah, sorry, Sarah. Come on, stand up. You'll be our Calvary Chapel. Okay, so... We probably need to have Amanda kind of move onto her desk area. So stand on top of your desk. You can stand on the chair. And then, so when we walk out, I see Calvary Chapel. Do, do I go around Calvary Chapel on the left or the right? So if I go left, that's the Talbot East building. So um, Rachel, why don't you be our Talbot East building? It's right next door to Calvary Chapel. Okay, so if I walk <clears throat> from Myers past Calvary Chapel around Talbot East, what am I going to walk between to get to the bell tower? Sutherland, yeah. So, Catch, why don't you come over here and you can be our Sutherland. So, I walk out of Myers. I see Kyrie Chapel right away. So, you probably need to scoot back, actually, Samantha. There you go. Because I, I walk out of there. I, I see Kyrie Chapel. I turn left, pass um, Talbot East, walk between Talbot East and Sutherland Building. I run into the bell tower. Praise God. I'm now at the bell tower. I see the library on my right hand side. I'm not too bad. All right, Chalisa, you're actually going to be Rosemead for us. Go ahead and stand up. All right. So, I'm, I'm walking. I'm walking between the bell tower, Rosemead. I see the library. Now where do I go? What happens now? Okay, there's a fountain. Why don't you be a fountain, Caroline? Okay, so we, I, there's, a, there's a fountain. What else? Is, what, else what other landmarks do I have? The Jesus? All right, come on over here, Samantha. You be our Jesus for us. You, you be the word, right? That's what it's called. Probably, if that's the fountain, where does she need to go? Okay, there you go. There you go. Strike the pose. Okay, so we've got to come this way a little bit because we're running out of room in the wall. Okay, so strike the pose. Excellent. So I passed Jesus. Connor says the calf is right here. It's pretty fast to get by. So come over here and be food. All right, so I'm at the calf. What do I do now? Horton. Horton. Come on up here, my friend. Where is Horton in relation to the calf? Behind it? Okay, we need to scoot that way just a little bit. Okay, Horton right there. Right here? Yeah. Okay. Over there. So is that the one with all the president's pictures on it? Yeah. Okay, so I see all the presidents. Good, good, lovely faces. Thank you. Okay, so Matt Horton, now what? Emerson's right over here? All right, Tess, be my Emerson, please. All right. Emerson would be closer. It's a guy's dorm. Oh, sorry. Emerson is closer to the couch. <laughs> All right, Tess, you're gonna you're gonna go ahead and still be Emerson, but just kind of go over where where Connor says. Okay. Am I at Alpha yet? No. What do I have to go? Okay. There's a parking lot. So is it the next building right after Emerson Horton? And I got Alpha. All right, so here's what I want you to understand. It was a fun way to wake you up in the morning because I saw you falling asleep last week. So here's the reality. 
It's my relation of understanding how Myers relates to Calvary Chapel, how it relates to Talbot East, how it relates to Sutherland, how it relates to the Bell Tower and Rosemead, how it relates to the fountain and the Jesus mural to the calf. It's, it's my relationships of how I see that, that I understand how to get all the way over here to Alpha to give my daughter some money. All right, let's give these volunteers a big hand, all right? So what I want you to think about, what I want you to think about when you're looking at all these details that you're looking at in this passage, I want you to think about what are the relationships. And you start doing that even with our paragraph summaries. So remember in section two of this paper, you have all these paragraph summaries. You know, short sentences, 12 words or less that are kind of summarizing what's taking place in that paragraph. Because it's kind of like the writers didn't write with punctuation, but how they phrase their words, we know that those words were the ending of a thought or the beginning of a thought. And so we see all these paragraphs that your publishers have put together in kind of grouping like verses together. It's not 100% same each Bible. So the reality is that this is just a good way to see what the author's flow is. Okay, so we're trying to understand the literary context and understand the author's flow. Well, one of the things we want to do then is start thinking, okay, how do these paragraphs all relate to each other? Okay, and we're looking, once again, we're looking for relationships. And so we do what we call a section summary. And a section summary basically helps you kind of understand the big picture of what's going on in this story. Now, oftentimes, for example, if you were doing a short passage, maybe one or two paragraphs, you could have one section summary just for that whole thing. Oftentimes, we like to think of section summaries like our chapter summaries. In other words, we're just saying, okay, here's you know, six or eight chap or paragraphs in this chapter. Maybe that's small enough that you could say, here's the key thought for this chapter. You did that in, cha in lab number three, whether you thought about it or not. Lab number three did not ask you to do paragraph summaries. I thought I did. Some of you helped me understand I didn't because I freaked you all out. I know, like, wait a minute, I didn't do that. So, but I didn't ask you to do paragraph summaries, but I did ask you to say, based on what you're seeing in this passage, what do you think is the key idea of this chapter? And so whether you did paragraph summaries or not, you automatically started saying, okay, here's all the things I'm seeing in this chapter, and you try to give a section summary for it. With a book as large as Esther, when we say provide section summaries, the most natural thing to do is to have all these chapter summaries. You might say, well, there's 10 chapters, there's 10 sections. I would challenge you to say the idea of a section summary is to keep trying to boil this down into bite-sized pieces. Because you're right, having you know, 50 or 60 paragraphs to me for Esther, that's a lot to get your mind around. So maybe you do go to the chapter, as, as your editors and scholars have put together, and say, okay, you know, what, what are these chapters? But then I would even encourage you to go one step farther. And you could actually show this in your paper if you want to. But to say, okay, how can I group these sections into larger section summaries? In other words, sometimes we don't want to just stay with chapters. We want to say, okay, these chapters can be grouped together to communicate a certain idea. The idea is if we can get to three or four large section summaries, now we have a better understanding of how to summarize the whole book in one sentence. So if someone's to ask you on the street, hey, tell me what the book of Esther's about, you don't have to take five minutes to tell them the story. In 30 seconds, you say the book of Esther is, and it's released the idea. So in your paper, section three of your paper is doing exactly this. You're moving from your paragraph summaries into your section summaries. So section two of your paper, paragraph summaries. Section three of your paper, section summaries, okay? But don't just stay with chapters. Get down to three or four sections. So you might want to keep this grouping idea. It's a great exercise because then the last thing you're going to do in the paper is you're going to give one summary statement, one sentence of the book. And remember, don't apply it. We're not in the application stage yet. So don't say we should all be like Esther and do this. Just say, here's what took place in the story. Here's what God did. Interestingly, we will talk about this once your paper is done. There's something that's missing from Esther and the writing of Esther that has created a lot of controversy. If you can identify it, you get more brownie points in heaven, but um, you don't get more credit. And well, maybe we'll see. But the reality is this: there's something missing from the book, 
and it's good to observe that, but the idea of this last summary sentence is just to do that, just to communicate, here's the what took place in this book. So we can build upon that to then interpret, okay? That's how you're going to finish your paper. Any questions? The instructions are on Blackboard. What I just explained to you right now is not. Shay. Those large sections are going to be only one sentence. Yes. Okay. Yeah, a summary is just a one sentence summary. Okay, and it, it might take you some time to, to, to boil all this information down. Any other questions? All right. So let's, let's talk about how do you do this? Because once again, you're going to have all this information about what's going on in this passage. Can you see the blackboard okay? With the talk? Okay. So, so I wanna, let's talk about how you take, you go from all these big picture detail, um, get, how to get the big picture through all the details. And once again, we're talking about understanding the relationship with each other. And what I wanted to suggest is that you do not, you do not have to do this on your paper. This is merely a, a, another way of kind of helping you understand what's taking place in the passage. But one of the things I would encourage you to think about is how to make a chart. Okay, making a chart of all the details going on in that passage. Whoops, I'm killing chalk left and right. On your, I guess this is your vertical axis, whatever this is, on, on this side of your chart, this is where I would put either your paragraph summary, if it's a small passage, or your section summary, if it's a large passage. Okay, so in other words, you're looking at something in a sequential order of how it's written. But what we're going to compare are different kind of categories along this horizontal axis, okay? So you could look at things that are emphasized. You can look at things that are repeated, you know, where certain things are repeated. You can look at what the, what, if you're looking at a narrative, you can look at the main character and say, okay, what was going on with the main characters in each one of these passages? So once again, it's like, how do I take all this information that's going on in this story, and how do I make sense of it so I can start to see the big picture what God's doing with all these little details? So let's, let's take an example of this. Take your Bibles, and let's go to Mark together, all right? So Mark chapter 4. Starting in verse 35, we see a series of miracles. Okay, Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. So, someone just tell me what the first paragraph, starting in Mark chapter 4, verse 35, where does it end? That first paragraph, where does it end? Just shout it out so I can put it on the board. Okay, so 38, okay. And then what else do we see? What's the next paragraph starting in chapter 5? 1 through what? We're looking at... Okay, so let's, let's take the whole story of what's going on here. So 35 through 41, we'll take that whole story as, we'll do this as a section summary, okay? So we'll make this more sections, and we're going to make each, each miracle its own section. Does that make sense? Okay, so we see the next miracle starting in verse 1, and it goes all the way through where? 20. Okay, excellent. So you have 1 through 20. What's the next story? 21 through... Sorry? 43, okay. Now, it's interesting in this story, you have a story within a story, right? 21 through 43. So in the middle, we have another story, starting at what? Mark 5, where does this story within a story start? 25, okay. Through what? 34, okay, great. So... We have a series of stories going on here, right? And I'm actually going to reverse these just because sequentially, even though the story starts earlier, it really is more the miracles after this, okay? Is it 43 you said? Okay. So, we're, once again, we're taking things that are emphasized, repeated, and related. So what's something that is repeated 
or emphasized in this passage? I already kind of gave you a hint. Miracles. Excellent. Hopefully the video can see this, but it says miracles right there. All right. So we see miracles. What's another thing that uh, we see that's repeated or emphasized by a large amount of space? I know you haven't read this, but if you look at it, what, what are just briefly, what's some things that you could see happening here? It's all right. Jesus speaking. Okay. And what he says, maybe the idea. Okay. One of the things that will be interesting is the means of how Jesus does that miracle. In other words, he didn't always just speak. Sometimes he did something else. Okay. There's another thing that's repeated. Levels of faith. Okay. So we have three things that, that have been repeated here. And so as we go along, we look at this. Let's pick up the story. It says in, in Mark chapter 4, verse 35, it says, That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. So there was a lot of people going along with Jesus and the disciples here. So the furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it nearly was, was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down. It was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. All right, so we have three, three things that have been repeated here that we lo we're looking at. There's a bunch more in this passage because stories are so rich in their narratives. But we have the first miracle. What was the miracle? Calming the storm. What's interesting about this miracle is Jesus is demonstrating his, his authority over nature or the physical world. Okay, and how does Jesus do this miracle? How does he calm the storm? Yeah, he speaks. Okay, and what does he say about the people's faith who are a part of this journey? What was he, what was he saying about them? Sorry, what? Yeah, no faith? I mean, it's like, come on, guys, how long have I been with you? You've seen other miracles. This isn't the first, you know, miracle that I've done. Why are you kind of living this way? Excellent, okay. So they have no faith. Well, the next story is he gets to the other side and there's this demonic that was there. And so Jesus heals the demonic. He casts out the demon. Make sure you understand it. The demonic is the person that's possessed, not the demon. Jesus didn't heal a demon. He basically freed a man from demon possession. So we see here, how does Jesus do it? Verse 8. Someone want to read it for us? Yeah, once again, he speaks. And interestingly enough, this time the realm that Jesus is dealing with is the spiritual. So he demonstrated just before this, I'm master of the physical world. Now he's showing you that I am master of the spiritual world. He speaks to make this happen. Now, interestingly, if you think about levels of faith, there's some interesting things that, that happen here. First, the people in the region plead with Jesus to leave. Okay, so the townspeople, what's their level of faith in Jesus? What do you think? It doesn't say the word faith, but what are they demonstrating? What's the level of faith that these townspeople are, are, are experiencing? Yeah, man. Okay, and they saw something still, and yet they still reject Jesus, right? So they see something, and they're like, we don't want it. We're scared of you. Which is kind of interesting, because even the townspeople were bothered by this demon-possessed man. All right? So in other words, even though Jesus dealt with one of their needs, he fixed one of their problems, basically, all of a sudden, the townspeople were like, you know what? We don't want it. Interesting, it's not no faith. It's a rejection of faith. But look what the de demonic man says. The guy who's been, you know, healed. He, he, he's in his right mind now. And, and he says in verse 18, it says, 
The guy begged to go with Jesus. And Jesus says, no, go home with your family. Think about it. He's been missing his family for how long? And Jesus says, go home to your family. Tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how much he had mercy on you. So the man went away, but he didn't go home. Look at this. Verse 20, he began to, yeah, so the man went home and began to tell the Decapolis, which is the 10 cities in that region, how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. So the demonic, the healed man's faith, well, the result is he wanted to follow Jesus. So you have a comparison now. So if you look at like things that are related, you have a comparison of the levels of faith here between the townspeople and this healed man who was a direct recipient. So you start to see a progression here of, of how these levels of faith are taking place. So basically, Jesus then gets in a boat, crosses over a lake. He's met by a, a, a synagogue ruler. So not a man who was a follower of Jesus, but a man who was a Jewish leader. And he has a crisis going on. Okay, his daughter is dying, and, and Jesus was the 911 call he made. Now, I know from being the chaplain of the fire department, people are in extreme panic when they dial 911, especially when there's a child involved. I mean, you cannot get there fast enough. You cannot do something fast enough when it's your child involved. And so Jesus, you know, gets this desperate call from, from Jarius to come. My daughter's dying. And so as they're going along, basically, there's this crowd that's all around Jesus constantly. And in the middle of that, a woman touches Jesus. Because she has been, had this bleeding situation for 12 years. And that has had physical consequences of pain and suffering. It has had um, spiritual consequences because she could not go to the temple and worship. It's had relational consequences because she's been unclean. So anybody that touches her in this situation is unclean. So she'd be avoided by family and friends. I mean, this woman has been suffering for a long time with this mentally and physically, emotionally and spiritually. And she spent all her money that she has on doctors. And yet she kept getting worse. And so when she hears about Jesus, she goes to him and she touches his cloak because verse 28 says, she thinks to herself, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body she was freed from the suffering. I love the words there about that healing that Christ brings. And Jesus looks around and says, who touched me? And she knows that she's been found out and so she comes before him and falls in with fear and she tells him the whole story. And in verse 34, Jesus says, listen to what he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So what's the miracle? Someone just shout it out at me. What's the miracle? Healing. healing. Yeah, the woman is healed. Okay, what's the means this time? Yeah, she touched. There was a touching. She reached out. Okay. She reached out. Okay, so once again, it's the physical realm. And what does Jesus say about her faith? Yeah. By your faith, you've been healed. So in other words, there are some good signs of faith here. In other words, this is a good statement. You have good faith, you know? This is something that, that we would say is commendable. We all would want this level of faith. Now, I want you to just imagine Jarius in that moment. He's like, come on, let's go, Jesus. You know, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's hurry up. And while he's standing there, he gets word that his daughter has died. It was tragic news. Because they actually say, why bother the teacher anymore? In other words, it's like, hey, it's hopeless. She's, your daughter died. She's gone. Let him, let, you know, let him go. But I love what Jesus does. So ignoring what they said, Jesus said to the synagogue ruler, do not be afraid, just believe. I don't know if any of you are here or dads with me, but the devastation that must have been on Jairus' face. In other words, Jesus says this not because, you know, hey, I, you know, it's all good, just come on. Jesus says this as a reassuring word because Jesus saw the pain and doubt in Jairus' face. And so he said, come on, it's okay. You know what, don't be afraid. And Jesus goes with Jairus and they go into the room, they send out everybody who's already wailing, and, uh, and, and he takes just a few of his disciples. I think it's really interesting that he only took a handful of his disciples, not all of them. And he comes to the girl and he, and he brings her back to life. And, he, and it basically, it's just, I love how it ends. He says, hey, give her something to eat. 
I love that. It's like Jesus is taking care of the most basic of needs. So here we have the last miracle of raising the dead. And what does Jesus do this time? You look at, we didn't read it, but what does he do? He does both. Yeah, he touches and speaks. We're just noticing details. I'm not trying to make any theological implication about it takes both touch and speech to raise the dead. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, let's look at the details here. And what's the level of faith here? What do you think? It's not mentioned. But what, using your minds, what do we see here? Okay, so in other words, faith to reach out and then doubt because they got the word, she's gone. But see, doubt, if it was just to stay there, would then give up. In other words, doubt's not the end stage. People say, well, I don't know if there's a God. Okay, what are you going to do with your doubt? See, doubt is either going to lead you to inaction and you're going to reject it. Or doubt's going to make you question it and pursue truth and find the answer. And what we see here with Jairus is that his, faith, his doubt turned into, I believe, great faith. Because to continue on and to send the people out and to risk that embarrassment as a, as a Jewish synagogue leader of having all these people gather around you and saying, no, go out, she's only asleep and I'm going to go with this guy and what he has to say. I think you, you see that change of doubt you know, to say, this is, I want to see where this could go, and I need answers, I need truth, and I'm trusting what you have to say. So we don't, we're not told the level of Jairus' faith, and we're not told about what, ha- what takes place after this. But what I want us to do is when you start to compare these different details, you start to see a progression of, uh, from no faith stories to great faith. In other words, the stories, beginning of these set of miracles, remember Mark's written to the Romans who have all this, you know, who are looking for a true God who's powerful. Well, it the, the comes back to God is the po- powerful over, over creation, over spiritual matters, over death, over, you know, suffering. And he, you know, can do it any way he wants to do it. And it's all about where's our faith in response. And you can start to kind of just put these details together to kind of take a bigger picture of what really is going on here. And I mentioned that kind of the same thing with your lab number three, when you looked at Matthew eight, how we saw, you know, this progression of, you know, of good faith. And then you had this key passage on what are you going to do about following Christ? And then after that, you saw these negative examples of faith. This is not needed for the paper, but this might be helpful to help you understand what's going on in this story. You know, so one thing you could do once you have all your sections, okay, not chapter summaries, but once you have all your sections, maybe you say, okay, looking at the story, I want to take some of the main characters. I want to take Esther. I want to take Mordecai. I want to take Haman. You know, and you say, okay, what, what was their role in each section of the story so you can see a better flow of it. This might be an exercise you put yourself through just so you better understand the big picture with all the little details. Because when you're in this last this stage of observation, you're going to have all this information. And how do you sift through it to say, okay, here's the key ideas that God was trying to communicate, um, and I'm going to be able to interpret it later on, but right now I will still want to know, God, what are you doing? All right? Any questions? Hey, how about that? We're actually two minutes early today. Have a great day. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.